Good morning and namaskars, everybody. We have a special uh, occasion today because the birthday of Swami Vivekananda. So the birthday, according to the Indian calendar, was just a couple of days back on the 3rd of February. And we had a puja, a ritualistic worship on that day to mark that day. And today we have the talk on Swami Vivekananda. In the English calendar, it is 12th January. And in India, everybody knows it because it's a national holiday. It's the National Youth Day in India. Vivekananda, of course, is extremely important for us here. It's very, very important, central. He's the founder. He's our founder. The Vedanta Society of New York exists because of him. We are all here today because of him. And in many ways, I think, um, Indian spirituality, Hinduism, yoga, Vedanta, and in an indirectly also, I would say, Buddhism and all other Indian spiritual traditions are all here because of Vivekananda. It might seem a big claim to make, but he was definitely the pioneer about that, there is no doubt. Uh, he came here at the World Parliament of Religions in 1893 to represent Hinduism. And um, what a remarkable description is given by Sister Nivedita in her introduction to the complete works of Vivekananda that when Vivekananda stood up to speak at the World Parliament of Religions in 1893, 19, 19, 1893, 11 September, 9-11, that was another date. New Yorkers, we remember 9-11 for something else entirely. But the two are not unconnected because Vivekananda spoke about the need for harmony of religions. He spoke about the need for acceptance um, and not fanaticism and violence in the name of religion. 9-11, 1893. Uh, Sister Nivedita writes, when Vivekananda stood up to speak, in front of him was the new civilization. Remember, the World Parliament of Religions was a part of a much bigger uh, the, the Colombian exposition. Uh, so the science and technology, uh, Tesla was there, the scientist, not the car. <laughs> Edison was there. They were demonstrating the latest technology at that uh, time, the, all the cool stuff like electricity. And uh, uh, um, there are different pavilions, a tremendous exhibition. And part of that was the World Parliament of Religions. So Sister Nivedita writes, when Vivekananda stood up to speak, in front of him was the power and grandeur and promise of the new civilization. And behind Vivekananda stood 5,000 years of patient development of the spiritual traditions of India. So he became a bridge between the East and the West. Not just metaphorically, not just as a nice way of writing this, you know, but he literally became a bridge. That's one of the things which he achieved in his life, in his all too short life. Uh, he became a bridge between the East and the West. He said, look at the confidence of this young man. As the Buddha had a message to the East, I have a message to the West. And what he started in 1893 continues down till today. Um, Phil Goldberg in his book, American Veda, he has traced the development and the um, in influence of Hinduism on American culture. So he traces it, of course, before Vivekananda, the, the transcendentalists, Emerson and Walt Whitman and Thoreau. But Vivekananda was the first authentic Hindu master, which people here in the West actually saw and experienced. And after Vivekananda came the other Swamis here in the Vedanta Society, Swami Abhidananda, for example, who has more than 20 years. And other Vedanta societies were established. Vivekananda established two. The one here, this one, and the one in San Francisco in 1899. And then other Vedanta societies were established, but not just Vivekananda and his disciples, the lineage which we belong to, but many others. Uh, in his footsteps came uh, uh, Swami uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, who established the uh, Self-Realization Fellowship, which is very popular even today in, you know, in Guru Swans, Los Angeles. You'll see the big ashram there and other places too. Um, all the other movements, whether it is Maharshi Mahesh Yogi's transcendental uh, meditation movement, uh, Srila Prabhupada came here to New York itself, uh, established the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Um, the entire yoga movement, you know, the physical side of it, which is very popular here in, in, uh, in New York and in the United States, before the coming of Ramdev Baba in India, I think it was more popular here than in India itself. Um, I mentioned to you on occasion that my experience at a school in Los Angeles was I was asked to speak about Hinduism. 
and I mentioned yoga. And one little boy stood up and said, oh, you have yoga in India too. <laughs> <laughs> Vivekananda did not openly teach the physical side of yoga, though, though there are uh, descriptions of him teaching the Shirshashan in a Ridgely manner, <laughs> and I was standing on his head. But uh, it, was, it was not part of his formal teachings. However, the Wall Street Journal, 2013, 10 years ago, they bought, uh, there's an article, um, the man who bought yoga to the West. <laughs> um, of course, it referred to his classic works, Raja Yoga and Karma Yoga, which were published from here. Um, in uh, New York Vedanta Society. And so the, he became a bridge between the East and the West, a bridge which is still strong and functioning uh, wonderfully, over which so many teachers, with so many traditions have been brought from uh, India to the West, to America, and across the world. And that's not the only thing he did. Then he went back to India and he roused his motherland, which was um, a colonized country, he said, you know, like a civilization, he said, is not dead but sleeping. Um, colonized and st starving and superstitious and illiterate. Uh, he, he roused the masses to a sense of their own civilizational identity. A historian said Vivekananda was the first of the Indian leaders who um, called himself Indian. Because at that time, if you see the history, the leaders who were coming up in Indian society, they would identify themselves as Maharashtrian, Bengali, Tamilian, and sometimes Indian. But Within a generation of Vivekananda, within one generation, all the leading uh, figures in Indian politics and social reform were calling themselves Indian. Somebody called Vivekananda, the historian said, the unconscious father of Indian nationalism. Unconscious in the sense he did not deliberately set out to do this, but he identified himself as Indian. And he toured the length and breadth of India, instilling in Indians a sense of their uh, civilizational identity, the glory of their religion. First and foremost, uh, awakening a sense of, uh, you know, uh, understanding and pride in their own spiritual religious traditions and the growth of nationalism and so many things, not just nationalism, it's like a range of political figures across the spectrum, whether it is Gandhi, who said, I read Vivekananda and my love for my country increased a hundredfold. Um, Nehru, Pandit Nehru, he says that in my generation, all of us, all of us, we read Vivekananda. Um, Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, he said at the age of 15, I came across the works of Vivekananda in a, with, with, a, with, a, with a neighbor. And in Vivekananda, I found what I was looking for. I, over the next few days, weeks, and months, I devoured Vivekananda, Subhash Bose writes. In fact, one day he ran away from home to become a monk. And uh, Swami Brahmananda, who was the president of the order at that time, said, tell the boy to go back. His destiny is different. He's not going to be a monk. Uh, his father, the eminent barrister, Janaki Nath Boshu, uh, he, annoyed at his uh, son's erratic behavior, he, has, he asked him, what do you want? And what exactly do you believe in? And the 17-year-old Subhas writes back, my philosophy is the philosophy of Vivekananda. So that way, a whole generation of Indian leaders were inspired, motivated, and given a vision by, by Vivekananda. But not just that, education, women's education. The one mission that Vivekananda entrusted Nivedita with was starting schools for girls, women's education, um, science and technology education. Um, on, we all know the story how on the boat from, the ship from India to uh, the United States actually is coming to Vancouver. And in Vancouver, there's a Vedanta society and their complaint is, Vivekananda landed here first. Everybody talks about Chicago, Chicago, but he came to Vancouver first. Um, he met Jamshedji Tata, the great, uh, you know, the grandfather of the Tata, Tata Industrial Group. He met him on the ship who was going to the United States, who was coming to the United States for looking for business opportunities. And what did they talk about? This Parsi businessman and the young Hindu monk. At that time, remember, Vivekananda was not known. Nobody knew about him. They talked about the possibility of science and technology education in India, in the future of India. Imagine. <coughs> they didn't talk about business. They didn't talk about spirituality. I mean, they must have. But he, they talked about um, science and technology in India. Later on, Tata writes back, writes to Vivekananda years later, saying that... Uh, um, saying that 
Remember, do you remember that we met on on the ship, and you mentioned to me the possibility of starting an institution for the for scientific research in India? I am seized of this idea, and I would very much like to do it. I cannot think of anybody better than you to be the director of this institute. And that letter is available, and that ultimately went on to become the Indian Institute of Science. Um, I mean, in every gathering with their Indian professionals present, scientists and technologists you will have some connection with that institute either you have visited it or you know somebody you studied there or you know somebody who studied there uh, it was known as the tata institute for a very long time even now the auto drivers in you know bangalore they will say tata institute um, just a little bit it's not relevant today but i'll add a little bit about it i didn't know the history behind it vivekananda envisioned it tata is the one who was the pioneer who left the money for it the land was acquired for it but vivekananda passed away in 1902 at the age of 39 he used to say i won't live to see 40 tata also died before the institute was established jamshed ji tata and the british government said the natives have no need of higher science and technology i mean science and technology education the natives don't need it it was nivedita who fought for it in um, uh, in india at that time calcutta was the capital of the british empire there and then she took it to london to the british parliament and finally got permission to start the what became the tata institute right um i don't know do i dare in this uh, audience uh, those who are present have some of you visited the indian institute of science oh quite a few you have, some of you have studied there or yes you have studied see it's always at least some will be there uh, who have studied or have visited definitely who have uh, or they know people who studied there or studied under people who studied there it was a pioneering institute but again more than this when the institute was uh, given permission this time i found out the leading one of the leading science institutes earliest in india is called the bose institute in india the bose institute the director of the bose institute told me some stories which i didn't know about um acharya jagadish chandra bose a leading uh, scientist of india uh, he um, was encouraged by vivekananda vivekananda heard his talk in the paris exposition 1900 and vivekananda said to the young indian bengali scientist he said uh, that uh, uh, you have electrified not only the plants but also the audience <laughs> and then he told nivedita to support acharya this uh, jagdish bose and nivedita was 9 years younger all this comes from the di present director of the bose institute who told me nivedita was 9 years 9 years younger than jagdish bose but she used to call jagdish bose koka which is the bengali word for a little boy <laughs> koka <laughs> and when jagadish bose did not get the nobel prize it was anticipated he would get it it went to roenjen uh, so he was depressed he broke down it seems and nivedita says kedona koka don't cry <laughs> little boy i will i will get money for you and you can start a science institute where you can carry on your research and inspire future generations of indian scientists she didn't have money she was actually practically poor she came to the she asked for money from sara bull wife of olibull they were independently wealthy and sara bull gave 4000 dollars which was approximately the amount of the prize money in those days it seems and that was given by nivedita to jagadish bose that became the seed money for the bose institute those who are in india and in the scientific community you know the import importance of the bose institute so one of the leading research institutes of india earliest and that's how it came about See behind this, this is a, just an example of the influence of Vivekananda. A good deal of it, which is not known, is not known. So, this is what Vivekananda did, and all of this he did in ten years, eighteen ninety-three to nineteen o two. On the fourth of July, nineteen o two, he was gone, deliberately. Sri Ramakrishna had said about Vivekananda that he is a he is the the ancient sage nara nara rishi the sage of ancient fame who has come down to the world to help humanity so this was sri ramakrishna's vision and the day but he doesn't know it he says the day he knows who he is he will give up the body voluntarily in yoga meditation which is literally what happened the first time sri ramakrishna met vivekananda young boy narendranath a brilliant young student uh, 
quite the man about the town and everybody admired him. Uh, he was, uh, the descriptions are he was very sociable, very friendly, uh, wonderful singer, debater, tremendously well-read, and sort of the life of the party. And he was invited to uh, Shurendra Babu's house when Sri Ramakrishna was invited in a religious program. And Narendra was invited to sing songs, devotional songs. Sri Ramakrishna was tremendously impressed by Narendra Nath. And he said, how does one like this live in Calcutta, which is a place of worldly people? In the midst of so many worldly people, where, where, how does this great yogi... He sees. Vivekananda himself did not. Narendra Nath himself did not see this. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna took him aside to the nearby room. And he started saying to Narendra Nath, why did you take so long? I've been waiting for you so long. My ears have fairly burnt off, uh, you know, hearing the talk of these worldly people. Uh, why did you take so long to come? And then he ho fo folds his hands and says, you are Nararishi, the, the, the ancient sage, come down for the welfare of the world. Narendra thought he was crazy. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm the son of Vishwanath Dutt, the famous uh, was a barrister, a lawyer in Calcutta. He thought this is this guy is a, is a maniac, <laughs> but he was irresistibly attracted to Sri Ramakrishna, and uh, he asked Sri Ramakrishna his question, which he had been going around asking people in Calcutta. Sir, have you seen God? Not do you believe in God? Not does God exist? Have you seen God? And for the first time, he got a direct answer straight away, with no hesitation. Sri Ramakrishna said, "Yes, I have. Just as I see you, only more clearly." Uh, what does it mean only more clearly? Did Sri Ramakrishna need glasses? No. Only more clearly means even the sensory perception which we have. This seems to be the most realistic thing, the most, um, you know, uh, the thing which reveals the world to us most directly. More directly than this. That means our own existence as pure consciousness. But also in the form of the personal deity as Kali. So Sri Ramakrishna said, as I see you even more clearly, and you can too. So Vivekananda would later say in this country, when he came here, he said, those who say that I have seen but you cannot and therefore you must believe in me, do not believe in such people, do not follow such people. But those who say I have seen and so you can too, you can trust such a person. Um, and then Sri Ramakrishna told others that he is Nararishi and the day he knows who he is, he will leave the body. And it happened in the 4th of July 1902. Few days before that, somebody inadvertently asked Swami, referring back to this incident, that do you know what he was talking about? And Vivekananda replied gravely, "Now I know. Now I know." Within a couple of days, within a few days, he was gone. So this was Vivekananda, and ten years he passed at the age of thirty-nine. No wonder he is the national youth icon in India, because we will always see the young Vivekananda. We will never see Vivekananda at 70 or 80. <laughs> we will always see Vivekananda forever, for the centuries, down the centuries, 39 years. That's, that's the story. It's a, it's a remarkable story, remarkable story. And as the decades and centuries roll down, I have no doubt that Vivekananda will stand tall. Uh, um, I, already we are seeing it. He was one among many great Indian leaders of that time. But over the last hundred years, I will not take names, the great figures in Indian history, there is no doubt we see them fading back into history. But Vivekananda is not fading, fading into history, clearly. Down till today, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who have kept Vivekananda alive and they follow Vivekananda. They want, they want to make Vivekananda their ideal in life. Whereas other great figures in Indian history at that time have faded back into the history books to some extent. No longer, let's say, living, inspiring ideals, not so much. And I'm sure this process will continue down the ages. Um, until a time will come in 100, 200 years, maybe we don't know when the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, one figure will shine back from, um, from history and that will be, will continue to illumine the future. And that will be Vivekananda. Sister Nivedita writes, he became a bridge not only between the East and the West, but at that moment when he stood up to speak at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, 11 September 1893, he became a bridge between the past and the future. He reshaped, this is my, my paraphrasing, Nivedita says he became a bridge between the past and the future of humanity also. So he reshaped our idea of what is spirituality. 
and the new spirituality which we see emerging in the last hundred years and more so in the next fifty hundred years we'll have an entirely new understanding of religion it's, it's farming we don't see the contours of it yet just few days back there was a news report now the single largest religious group in in the united states is sbnr spiritual but not religious <laughs> And clearly it's a movement, whether you like it or not, clearly it's a movement which can be traced back to the teachings of Vivekananda and others who followed him. People who say that we are spiritual, but we, don't, we are not interested in organized religion. So that was Vivekananda. Um, today, I haven't started by the way. <laughs> this is all just an intro. Today I want to address I want to draw upon Vivekananda's teachings and uh, address one question. One question which I come across often and I hope we will get a, a powerful answer today is, uh, Swami, we hear all these non-dual teachings, Vedanta, that I'm not the body-mind, I'm pure consciousness, I'm Brahman, and I sort of get it. But then next what? There are many forms this question takes. Uh, one form is, what do I do next? Or it's like this, that I get it, but it seems very philosophical, theoretical to me, not very practical to me. Or the question takes the form that I get it, I understand it, but it's very difficult to, you know, um, take it out into the world and practice it, live it. Another form it takes is, uh, I understand what's being taught, but I understand, but it's not really real for me. And if the goal is to overcome suffering, if the goal is to attain fulfillment, I'm sorry, but the goal is not being attained. I still feel, so. I'm still the old, same guy. Even if I say I am Brahman, as somebody said, you're still the same dude. <laughs> there isn't much difference. So wh what's the answer to this question? What next? If it's not working, if it's not, uh, this is Vivekananda addresses this. And so I'm drawing upon one of his classic works, um, Karma Yoga. There's a lecture there called Freedom. I think the talk was given here in New York. In any case, the book was published from New York. The first edition of Karma Yoga from New York. And it was published during Vivekananda's own lifetime. So I've even seen a signed edition of uh, uh, Karma Yoga, signed by Vivekananda himself. It's in the archives in, in Hollywood, in the Vedanta Society there. So it was published during the lifetime of Vivekananda, as was Raja Yoga, of, again from the Vedanta Society of New York. Um, J.D. Salinger, a beloved novelist, Catcher in the Rye, they recently made a movie about him, Rebel in the Rye. So he uh, was close to the uh, East Side Center, the Ramakrishna Vivekananda Center, and he was a disciple of Swami Nikhilananda. M many people don't know that. Uh, Mantra Shishya had taken initiation from Swami Nikhilananda. In fact, in the movie, I didn't see the whole movie, but I saw that part. Somebody sent it to me, a friend of uh, mine. Uh, that where he meets the Swami and goes there, they've depi depicted it very nicely, uh, that he goes to the East Side Center and meets the Swami. Anyway, Salinger has said, these two classics, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, these two classics, our American youth would do well to carry around in their pockets. This was in the 1960s, he writes this. So in that book, Karma Yoga, there's a chapter, Freedom, very profound, very deep. I'm going to give give us a bird's eye view, a quick tour of the ideas in that, in that talk and a single solution to this question. Keep the question vibrating in the mind. So Vedanta, I get it. Now what? Now what? That's the answer here. Uh, why do we have this question? Why is it a problem and what's the solution? Vivekananda gives a powerful, very clear solution. It's like a challenge to us. It's doable. Everybody can do it. If you are interested in spiritual life, you can do it. And you can do it straight away. And you can do it all day long, all life long. So what is this answer? What's the problem? And then the answer. In the talk, uh, in that lecture, Freedom, it starts off with karma. That's our topic today, freedom and karma. Karma means work. The Sanskrit word karma means work. But the other meaning of karma is causality. Here I'm quoting from Vivekananda. Karma means causality, the law of karma. This is something that is sort of universal to Indian thought. All schools of Hinduism, all schools of Buddhism, Jainism, ancient philosophy, all ancient Indian philosophers, whatever they believe, except the materialists, of course, the Charvakas, all the others, 
Some of them didn't agree on whether God existed. Some of them didn't agree on whether the soul existed. But they all agreed on karma, uh, causality. And that's sort of common sense. If you are a reasonable person, even the higher animals have this understanding of causality. If you do this, that will happen. Even, I think, B.F. Skinner here, here in, in New York, I think, 1920s, he taught pigeons and rats and uh, uh, how to use causality, trained them. So causality is something that's inherent to us. And it was um, a common idea, axiomatic in Indian philosophy. Um, what is causality? Causes have um, effects. Actions have consequences. Just this much, but extended to the moral life of human beings. Uh, so it goes like this. The basic form of the law of, of karma. Consciously done, consciously done, good action, good moral action. Sanskrit word, dharma. It produces an effect called merit. Sanskrit word, punya. Which leads to an effect in our lives. Uh, which is some kind of pleasant result will be there. Some kind of happiness. Things which are good, which you would want happen to you. Sanskrit word, sukha. Happiness. Consciously done, deliberately done, immoral action. If we are deliberately naughty, that is Sanskrit word is adharma. Adharma. The result of that, there is a result which is called a demerit in Sanskrit, papa. And the result of that we see in our lives uh, as unpleasantness, misery, sorrow. And things which we want don't happen. Things which we don't want happen to us. And that is Sanskrit word is dukkha. So now we can put it uh, like this. Dharma or uh, moral action. Uh, merit or punya and going to resulting in sukha or happiness. Adharma, deliberately done immoral action um, resulting in papa, demerit and the result will be dukkha, unhappiness. And that's it. So what we see in our lives as uh, um, pleasantness or unpleasantness, sukha and dukkha are the results of what we have done but you might say doesn't seem to work. Um, it works only if you extend it to past lives. And what we do in this life will give rise to pleasantness and unpleasantness. And that also works only if we extend it to future lives. And therefore you see as a logical implication of karma, as a, as a necessary, cor uh, uh, necessary corollary of karma is reincarnation. Punar Janma. That's why in all schools of Indian philosophy, again with the exception of the materialists, all schools of Indian philosophy, they accept, all darshanas, Indian darshanas accept multiple births. Past lives, future lives, we continue to exist. We have existed in the past. The baby was no, is born then, the body is born. But that embodied being, that sentient being, that is an ancient creature, not a newborn baby. And so it has come with its own load of karma and will go on after this life to other lives. This is in a sense the law of karma. And this is sort of universally accepted or understood in Indian thought. Um, Vivekananda puts it more succinctly. He says, good, good, bad, bad, none escape the law. But whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. If you wear a body, if you're embodied, like all of us are, um, we have a chain tied to our feet. The chain is for our past action. How do we know? We see a series of things happening in our lives. Anybody who's mature, who has lived 10... You know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years in life, we'll say a good deal happened in our lives which we did not calculate or anticipate. Some things went according to our plans. Lots and lots of things didn't. Didn't. And they didn't because most of our life doesn't go the way, exact way we have planned it. A lot of things happen, the big things, birth, parents, the environment we are born into, our state of health, you know, the big illnesses and um, shocks that we come into physical level, then marriage, your spiritual life, um, then uh, um, the general levels of success or failure in life, and then uh, finally the lifespan. All of these are predetermined by our karma. Good deal of the game is fixed. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we may struggle this way and that way. We may do lots of things. And if we do, that's good because 
what we are doing now determines our future life. Mm-hmm. Vivekananda put it this way. It's not fatalistic. What we are today, take responsibility for this is what we have made of ourselves. And how we react to what life throws at us. What does life throw at you? None of it is undeserved. It's all what we did in the past. What does life throw at you? And then how you react to it, that will determine your future. So this law of karma, this is called the law of karma. Um, it's part of our belief system. Why do I say belief? Why isn't it scientific? Because, notice, action and the result are both observable. But in between, that it produces an, effort, an effect. Papa, punya, the merit and demon. That's a matter of belief. Who sees that? Nobody sees that. So it is something that is sort of axiomatic to our belief system. And Vivekananda, um, just for the sake of completion, I will put, pull in some subtle points he makes. He says, what is law? He says, the karma is this universal law. So what is the law? Um, law is a, a pattern of repetition. Vivekananda says there is actually no law in reality outside. It is the way that the mind grasps a pattern of repetition, uh, which, uh, you know, series of events happen repeatedly, and we associate it in the mind, and then we give it the name law. We give it the name causation. Now, that's something, uh, it's actually a pretty subtle and... uh, a position which can be disputed and debated because our common sense idea is that there is a law in nature and that's what science is going out and discovering. Though the latest, most sophisticated thinking in science about causality is coming closer to what Vivekananda is saying. There are observations which we make and the way the mind grasps these observations is what we call law. So, Vivekananda makes a connection between causality and mind. How? Causality is a law, and the law is not out there, it's in the mind. I will not go further into this, I'll just say what Vivekananda said, and then we'll move on to the main question. He brings in a term called Vyapti. This may be one of the few times he does so, Vyapti. In English, he will spell it as V-Y-A-P-T-I. Sanskrit term, it's borrowed from the, it's not a Vedantic thing, it's borrowed from the Nyaya philosophy. Nyaya philosophy. What is the Nyaya philosophy? It's a school of Indian school of logic. And they were masters at inference. The masters at inference. The Sanskrit term for which is anumana, inference. Direct perception is what we see. But most of our knowledge is not direct perception. We are not seeing the whole world. A lot of things we know which we are not seeing or hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. It's beyond our range of our senses. How do we know anything? A lot of scientific knowledge. A lot of our common sense. It comes from inference. And what is inference? Inference is this pattern of things. The classic example in in, uh, uh, Nyaya philosophy is smoke and fire. So uh, we always see that when uh, when there is smoke, there is fire. Not the other way around. There may be fire in the smokeless grill or something and no smoke. But when there is smoke, generally there is fire. If it's real smoke, it's being generated by fire. So we see smoke and fire, smoke and fire, smoke and fire. Then we make this connection that the fire is causing the smoke. And therefore, the smoke is the effect, fire is the cause, causality. How did we come here? By watching this repeated pattern and then grasping it as fire is the cause and smoke is the effect. Now, what use is this? Here is the use. Suppose I don't see the fire. I just see the smoke pouring out of the next door building. I saw that once actually a couple of years back. And then brownstone, a few buildings down. What do you immediately infer? There's a fire. Did you see it? No. You didn't see it. You inferred it. This is called inference. You have seen the effect and you are inferring the cause. You've seen the smoke, you're inferring the fire. And then you call 911 and the people come and they actually do find a fire and put it out. So, by seeing the effect, we infer the cause. This is called inference. You're not directly seeing the fire, but you know there is a fire. How do you know without seeing? By inference. In Sanskrit, this is called anumana. This is the basis of science. All our science is inference. We have a little bit of observational data, we have a hypothesis, and then we make the inference. We make the, it's a very sophisticated process. Basically, it's inference. 
Our common sense is basically inference. It's called anumana. And then crucial to this anumana is vyapti. What is vyapti? This continuous occurrence of two things together. If you can establish that there is this causal link between smoke and fire, then you can happily infer fire whenever you see smoke. I'll repeat that. Crucial to your inference that if you see smoke, there must be fire. You have to establish that there is this link, causal link between smoke and fire. If you, if you one day find smoke but no fire, then your whole inference becomes shaky. Because next time you see smoke, you will think, is that really a fire? Is it that special smokeless, a fireless smoke? Is it one of those things? How will you know? So vyapti is very important. As you can see, technically it's very crucial. And uh, the ancient Indian logicians, they spent a huge amount of brain power, processing power, trying to define what this vyapti is. And uh, just for the sake of digression, but um, one of the things that those who study ancient Indian logic, there's something called the neologic school, the school of new logic in India. Um, New logic in India is also more than a thousand years old, so everything new <laughs> is relative. There was a great master logician called Gangesha, and he wrote, he was from Mithila, which is in Bihar, and he wrote this book, uh, Tattva Chintamani, the, the, the jewel of, um, of what Tattva would be, truth, uh, of reality. So an inquiry into the jewel of reality, Tattva Chintamani. There he gives five definitions of Vyapti. I'm just putting it out there. It's, it's no, nothing to do with what Vivekananda is saying. There are five definitions of Vyapti. Why? Because Vyapti is very important for logicians. He gives five definitions. The whole thing is one paragraph. Five definitions, five sentences. And it's a whole one-year postgraduate course, maybe, in uh, logic in India. I have a book which is 400 to 500 pages explaining those five sentences. So that's how subtle. We think Vedanta is full of subtle arguments. It's child's play compared to what the neologicians were doing. Extraordinary subtlety. Vivekananda himself says, the most subtle and complex form of logic that the world ever knew. In fact, until recently, until we have in the 19th and 20th centuries, the development of mathematical logic, symbolic logic, this ancient Indi the Indian logic, especially the new logic school, thousand years old. So most sophisticated, subtle, complex, and powerful school of logic. Compared to that, Aristotelian logic is, uh, is crude. Uh, if it's, uh, it's now only philosophers in the West also are beginning to plumb the depths of that new logic. Anyway, put it aside, Vyapti. Now, Vivekananda comes to the crucial question. So you said law, vyapti, universal law, but what is this universe? So Vivekananda then goes, plunges directly into non-dualism. He says this universe, what we are experiencing, is only a tiny part, a glimpse into reality. There is an unlimited reality, a limitless existence, consciousness, place. What do I mean by limitless existence? Existence that is not cut off by birth and death. It's not that something that comes into being did not exist and comes into being and then changes and then ages and dies and goes out of being. Not that kind of existence. Limitless existence. And all pervasive, everywhere it is there. Yeah. And everything, nothing is different from it. So this limitless existence, this limitless consciousness, this limitless fulfillment, sat, chit, ananda, this is the nature of reality. And that is, that is the real existence, that is, that is reality itself. What we experience as reality is through our minds and senses, is what we hear, smell, taste, touch, is what we think about it and uh, understand it and desire and like and hate and we deal with it through the mind. This is what, this is that, is a slice of that reality, grasped by our senses and our mind. And this slice of reality, he says, it is reality coming to us through Maya. It is that limitless existence, consciousness, bliss, limitless Brahman coming to us through Maya. What is Maya? Space, time and causation. It's a theater. It's like a, like a Broadway play 
on stage comes the universe but how what do you see the universe as not as limitless existence consciousness bliss but you see it as not limitless existence you see it as existing things chairs and tables plants and and rocks and lakes and sky and earth existing things this limitless awareness comes into this through maya on stage before us what does it come as it comes as seeing hearing smelling tasting touching it comes as thinking remembering desiring it comes as waking dreaming sleeping that limitless fulfillment bliss comes to us on stage through the uh, through the um, lens of maya space time and causation what do we experience it as we experience it as the as the pursuit of pleasure we experience it as the pursuit of beauty aesthetics we experience it as the pursuit of meaning in life purpose of life what's the point of it all <coughs> in reality it is sat chit ananda and this sat chit ananda we experience as existing things in the universe as our conscious experience of the universe and as our sense of meaning purpose values beauty existence consciousness bliss look at the grand questions of philosophy what is real metaphysics ontology how do we know anything epistemology and what's the point of it all uh, it's this is called uh, axiology uh, earlier it used to be called uh, ethics and aesthetics and all they have clubbed it together a, a science of values and look at what what vedanta says is ultimate reality sat chit ananda the direct answers to these three questions what is ultimately real sat pure being according to vedanta how do we know anything at all how is knowledge possible chit consciousness what's the point of it all what are we chasing here ananda bliss and vedanta goes further not only giving these grand answers and long ago 5000 years ago in the upanishads not only giving these grand answers vedanta goes further and says this satchidananda it is no theory it is no speculation it is absolute fact why should i believe you how how do i know what fact is it it's you tatvamasi you are that you are limitless existence you are limitless consciousness you are the sum total of all fulfillment satchidananda it is you are you a, a theory do you consider yourself to be a theory do you consider yourself to be some kind of speculation everything else can be a theory to you everything else can be speculation for you but you are you are real are you not does anybody doubt his or her own existence say yes yeah, swami that sounds nice but i exist that's one thing i have no doubt about it but it's not a limitless existence i'm born and i age and i know i'll die and i'm aware i know but i'm more aware after a cup of coffee and i'm less and less aware as you go on in long meandering talk <laughs> and, and fulfillment well i have bits and flashes of fulfillment in my life but not much it's mostly dull dreary boredom punctuated by moments of terror and unhappiness and anxiety <laughs> so that is my life that's it's not limitless existence consciousness bliss this is what vedanta wants to show us you do exist there's no doubt nobody doubts it and this existence if you investigate it if you were to investigate it it would reveal itself as immortal being as limitless awareness and as endless fulfillment we do not know it we are chasing it in the world what do we experience in the world it is that limitless existence consciousness uh, being coming to uh, this our experience through time space and causation through our minds and senses as this world as this little life where we seem to be born and age and die and so on and vedanta wants to show us behind it all behind this universe behind means the reality of this universe is brahman behind yourself behind yourself means not there you know it happens the enlightened ones they want to show it it's something obvious to them and they want to show it to us but you don't see it i remember swami ranganatha anand ji of revered memory he is the 13th president of our order and we were one day bowing down to him if he was in his late 90 mid 90s he's talking about the atman the real nature our real nature and he said he said two things uh, he, one thing he said 
you know what it's like this the simplest analogy and the cutest analogy i've heard about the ultimate nature of things he said it's just like your favorite pillow you can relax back into <laughs> it's right there and i was i remember peering behind him there was just the wall nothing else was there <laughs> right there means not the, our, our experiences of the world not the senses through which we experience this world not the mind which processes the data of the senses that to which this entire display appears you turn in words into that you are that this is what vedanta tells us and all the processes of vedanta all that we study in vedanta is trying to point it out to us it's obvious for the enlightened one not so not at all obvious for us because it's not obvious for us what do we do what is available to us this world which it is that infinite reality itself being grasped through the mind and the senses this world we take it to be the only reality this body we take it to be the only reality this little life birth aging death we take it to be the only reality and then we grasp it this grasping is what what the buddha identified as the sole cause of all our trouble he called it tissa in 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 pali in sanskrit it is trishna thirst this thirst this thirst for this continued limited existence this continued i must live like this and these must be mine all the things that i want must be mine the people that i want things i want the position i want at the moment what i want is continuously subject to change nobody can say even amazon prime can't satisfy you because <laughs> continuously subject to change we get it uh, we really want it we get it oh not good i have to return it <laughs> and then we get the next one and then we throw it away and so this is what is going on in our lives we are trying to grasp what we want in this limited world this limited world is that lim- unlimited coming to us through time space and causation how is it coming through our mind and senses that's how we are grasping it now little bit let's look under the hood what's going on here you see the subtlety of vivekananda's approach it seems to be unconnected he suddenly talked of law of karma then he talked about vyapti now he's talk- talking about non duality the brahman and all that but notice if you bring them together the this causality which is law of karma it is part of maya time space and causation it is in this universe not in the ultimate reality uh-huh. you see if you put it together and this causality law of karma it is this universe because it is on the stage the broadway stage of maya the stage is made of causality it's made of time and space and causality and the play is taking place there so when we deal with this universe everywhere there is causality cause and effect actions have consequences and none escape the law but the law is very much part of maya part of this play part of this movie we are watching and connected to it is the mind that's what vivekananda brought in it's the mind which grasps this repeated pattern of occurrences and calls it law so causality maya mind and our little life they're all connected reality lies beyond causality beyond the mind beyond this little life if it lies beyond what is it to us but it's you you lie beyond it all and the solution is given by vivekananda good good bad bad none escape the law whosoever wears a form must wear the chain too then next so what's the solution he says but far beyond name and form is atman ever free no thou art that sanyasi bold say om tat sat om beyond this name and form beyond causality beyond mind beyond this universe is the reality so no thou art that tatvamasi and say om tat sat om so that is freedom freedom from causality freedom from maya freedom from the mind all of it is the same thing basically it sounds very abstruse and distant not at all it's as distant as you are from yourself how far are you from yourself no distant the only distance between you and that reality is ignorance and knowledge it's not a journey from one place to another it's not a journey from one time to another it's not somewhere that we have to go it's not something that we have to wait for it's right here right now it's always there all the time 
then why, why can't we access it? It's knowledge. It's ignorance, which is a veil, and we do not know that reality. That's why we grasp Trishna, this thirst. Vivekananda says, this is what traps us in this world. We want, we think this play is the only reality that there is. And we want it to continue, and we want it to go the way it will, uh, we, want, we, we would like it to. It will not go the way we would like it to. Because it's determined by our past karma. It's the director is God, not in our hands. And thank God, if the plays in Broadway were to go the way we want it, it would be utter chaos. <laughs> it would be madness. And then if the plays went the way we wanted it, and at the end of it, we would be the biggest critics. It is so awful. <laughs> no, it is going the way. There is a director behind it. It's going the way it is. And the whole point of this game, what's the, then what's the point of it all? The point is our liberation. point is our freedom. All right. I don't know if I'm doing justice to this talk. You can just see how profound and vast it is, what, what grounds it covers. So I, I recommend that we read this talk, the freedom, the, the talk on freedom in Karma Yoga. It's the last but one chapter on karma, in Karma Yoga, small book. Um, amazing. I'm not even one third of the way down, by the way. Now, we are about to run out of time, but still, now this is the, this is the um, solution. You have to realize that you are limitless existence, consciousness, bliss, aham brahmasmi, beyond the body, mind, beyond this time, space and causation. Vivekananda says, what is this universe? It is infinite. It comes into limitation and it goes into the infinite. Our lives, what are they? They are infinite. They seem to have come into limitation and they go beyond. Advaita Vedanta says, yes, it is infinite. And now also it is infinite. It has not come into limitation. And not that it will go on to infinity. It, it, is, it will always remain what it is. Only now there is the appearance of limitation. Appearance of one, one little being struggling in the world. You know, no, it, it, You will realize when we become enlightened, we will realize it was always alright. It was always alright. There was never any problem at all. We will realize that. But right now, it, that's not true. That, that, right now, Vivekananda here brings in the question of free will. He says, now with this background, take up the question of free will. You, now you see, Vivekananda says, now you see there cannot be anything as, such as free will. Because there is freedom. Your limitless nature, existence, consciousness, bliss, that is freedom. In fact, one of the terms used for uh, Brahman in, the, in Vedanta is moksha swarupa, the very nature of freedom. The goal is freedom, moksha, mukti, freedom. So there is freedom. And Vivekananda says, that freedom when it passes through time, space and causation, it comes to the realm of causation, it comes to the realm of law, it comes to the realm of actions and effects, actions and consequences, then it's no longer free. Everything here has a precedent. Remember the chain of events which the mind is grasping as law, a pattern, Fire, smoke, fire, smoke. So everything here, every smoke has its fire behind it. So it is not free in that sense. Uh, in, in this world, we seem to have a sense of freedom, but nothing in this world is free. It is determined by past causes and consequences. He, he is talking about a kind of determinism here um, in this world. It's so interesting. Just recently, a book which has been making the waves, de um, Determined, Sapolsky, Robert Sapolsky, he is a professor at Stanford, I think. Um, if you look, he looks like an ancient Indian rishi. He's this long beard, and uh, and uh, he his basic thesis is there is no free will. We think we are free. Sorry, you are not. Yeah. Everything that you think you're doing freely is determined, and it can be predicted earlier by brain science or you know. So uh, it's a big, complex book. I'm trying to make some inroads into it, but. He makes a strong case, and it's a disturbing case, that what we think is freedom, our entire society is based on the assumption that we are free. Yeah. You go to the uh, supermarket, tremendous variety of choices. Why? Because they think you're free to choose. You go to elections, and um, you have a choice between the candidates. Why? Because you think you're free to choose. The judge, you, somebody's hauled up before the judge and accused of a crime and punished. Why? Because the judge, the law assumes you are free to do otherwise, but you chose to be naughty, so you need to be punished. And so freedom is assumed in law, in economics, in politics. It's assumed in religion. Why would you say do this and don't do that unless there is freedom? 
So what is assumed, but yet investigate, it doesn't seem to be true. And Vivekananda says, no, in this world of Maya, it is determined. There is a, causality is upon us, karma is upon us. However, Vivekananda says, now he, he, says, as, he asks this question once again, what is this universe? He says, it has come from freedom into bondage and it shall go on to freedom. What are we? We have come from freedom into bondage and we shall go on to freedom. Only Advaita Vedanta says here, you have come from freedom seemingly into bondage. You are still free and you realize that you are free. And then you will, you, will, you will enjoy the benefits of that freedom here. But body and mind and senses will always be trapped in this uh, chain of causality. The body will age. It will get disease. It will die. Nothing can stop it. Because it's part of a chain of causality. Now what? Vivekananda now says, now we can begin. <laughs> Vivekananda now says, don't worry, I, I won't prolong the t torture. <laughs> I'll just give you the solution. The problem, Vivekananda says, all this is fine. Uh, we realize we are Brahman, you go through Drik Drishya Viveka, the process of seer and seeing, you go to the anal analysis of the five sheets of the human personality, you go to the analysis of waking, dreaming, deep sleep, you know, Mandukya Upanishad, and all these things we have been talking about. And you get a clear understanding. And yet it doesn't make a difference to our lives. Why? Because we are unable to give up this trishna, this thirst for holding on to this little life, which is in bondage, which is trapped within maya. And we want this, we want to be like this. But you can't be free like this. You have to step back from this little life into your infinite nature. But we don't want to. So Vivekananda says, there are these two great paths. One he calls the path of neti neti, not this, not this, the negative path, the direct path. Most powerful, spoken of in the Upanishads. Why is it most powerful? Why is it called direct? Directly your, your real nature is pointed out. And hopefully we will get it. When you get it, you notice two things. It is effortless, it's, it's uh, instantaneous. Who doesn't want instantaneous spirituality? Everybody wants, oh I want to be Buddha, but right now. And I want to be Buddha, but without all the trouble that Buddha went through, the ten years of uh, extremely hard work, no. Uh, I want to be Buddha without any effort and right now, yes, I, I'm going to sign up for that. And the Advaita path seems to promise that, instantaneous, effortless. But notice, none of them who become in, uh, enlightened, uh, what's his name, uh, Sam Harris, he pointed out that notice none of them who became enlightened, even if they talk about direct path and so on and so forth, they all practiced and they all tried and usually for a long time. And then he says, assume you are like one of them. So it's better to sign up for practice and hard work over a long period of time. Now, um, this is one path. You realize that and then, next. This is next, the path, the direct path says, live according to what you have realized. If you realize you are limitless consciousness, live like that. What does it mean, live like that? The ask is very high there. You live like that means you be fearless. You, nothing you should be afraid of. Tomorrow the doctor hands me a diagnosis of terminal disease. You're going to, you've got only one month left or 15 days left. It should matter nothing to me. Because I know this body is nothing. One day it will go. It's an appearance in limitless awareness existence which I am. Can we do that? Nothing should be able to tempt me. Nothing should be able to terrify me. Why should anything tempt me? I am limitless existence. Whatever exists. Is the ocean uh, tempted by one wave? No, that wave is part of me anyway. That wave doesn't exist apart from me. No thing in the world, no person in the world, no power in the world, no pleasure in the world should be able to uh, tempt me or move me. No threat in the world should be able to terrify me. Yes, when bad things happen, we should react and uh, do the best that we can. But we will not be shaken by anything in the world, no matter how much of a disaster it is. If you have realized that you are Pranathan. Is it that easy? No, no. He said, look, the ask is too much. It wants you to be perfect, a Buddha, a Jivan Mukta, right now. Why? And the, their position is correct. They say, why should you not be? Because you are Brahman. Right now you are. You have always been. Step back from this delusion and realize your true nature. Vivekananda says, no, thou art that. Far beyond is Atman ever free. No, thou art that sannyasi bold. Say Om, Tat Sat Om. We cannot. We have to admit we cannot. Then is the path wrong, the direct path? No, it's not wrong. Remember, they have 
bounded it with very high entry requirement. Viveka, Vairagya, Shamadamadi, Shatsampati, Mumukshutta, what do these terms mean? Capacity to discern between the eternal and non-eternal, between the reality and appearance. Then Vairagya, deep dispassion for the appearance. And the disciplines, perfect control of mind and senses. Remember, it is mind and senses which bring the world to us through time, space and causation. Perfect control of the minds and senses. An intense desire for freedom. Now, if we don't have that, then we can't blame that path. They already told us to, to make this real, you must come with these qualifications or at least develop. Generate these powerful qualifications. Once you have these qualifications, you can see that um, then this realization, you'll be able to live according to your understanding then. Long ago, Plato said, to know the good is to be good. We immediately rebel. No, to know the good is not to be good. We know what is good, but we can't be good. That's our problem. But the, <laughs> the old philosopher was right. It's only when the mind is pure and clear and you are under, in control of yourself, then to know the good is to be good. Why wouldn't you be good? Why wouldn't I be good if I know it's good? I acknowledge it's good and I'll be good. I'll do what is good. But I can't. I cannot. What comes in between? Human condition comes in between. It's called Trishna. This clinging to this little life. I, me, mine. Then Vivekananda says, and this is the point of the whole talk, that there is another way. He says it's a slower way, but it's an easier way and it's doable right now. Instead of turning away from the appearance, instead of turning away from time, space and causation, instead of turning away from mind and senses, you plunge into this appearance. You use the world and use your experience of the world to evolve in spiritual life and attain to that same non-dual uh, liberation. How do you do that? He calls it the path of iti iti. These are the words he used. This, this. Neti neti, not this, not this. Iti iti, this, this. He says there, the problem is not the world. The problem is not even karma. The problem is not even causality, time, space. Cause. None of these are a the problem. Why should they be a problem? They have been put in place to help us in our spiritual evolution. The problem is one word, attachment. He says, the moment you... Throughout this tentacle of I, me, mine. That he calls it the tentacle of selfishness. Stop being an octopus, a squid. Throwing out this tentacle of selfishness and trying to grab the world as I, me, mine. I want it this way and not that way. No, stop that. When you stop that, what do you replace it with? This detachment, this continuous, he calls it this continuous sacrifice of the little self. Keep saying, not I, not mine. This detachment with involvement in the world. You continue, to, Vivekananda says, you continue to have your family, your job and your occupation in the world and take care of the body and live your life in the world as it is presented to us as part of the Broadway play, as part of Maya. Live your life there. But introduce this, not I, not me, not mine. This continuous, in his words, continuous sacrifice of the little self. He, he gives us a prayer, actual prayer to, uh, for, to repeat continuously. He says, none of it for me, the good, the bad or the indifferent. I do not care for any of them. All of this I offer to thee, God, in whatever form, the director of the play. It is all thine. I just acknowledge it. It's all thine. This body, this mind, these powers of our senses, this life that I have, the people I have around me, I know it's generated by my past karma. I continuously offer it back to the Lord. Not me, not mine. This practice of continuous detachment, non-attachment. Vivekananda says, this will free you. This will free you. Live here. You don't have to deny it. Live here in this world. He says, he gives an example. Um, the negative example is, suppose there's a painting you admire it very much. <coughs> and then it is destroyed or burned. And you say, oh, too bad. It's, too, uh, it's a loss. But suppose it was your painting. You said it's mine. And then it's destroyed. And the effect on you is devastating. You'll never forget it. You'll be traumatized. Why? It's the same painting and the same destruction. But because of the tentacle of selfishness, that it is mine. Notice, Vivekananda says, you may possess it also. Legally, it is yours. 
but internally, mentally, don't say it is mine. Then he gives a positive example. A child. You have a son or a daughter. He says, yes, of course, have the child. And, but internally, don't say mine. The Lord is present in me in this form. And I shall worship the Lord. Yes, give the child education, nurture. and You take care of the child as you would. Probably better if you feel that your beloved Krishna or Rama or Ramakrishna is present in the form of that child. Every little boy is, you know, there is a saying, uh, is Mahadeva, Shiva. Every little girl is Parvati or Gauri, the Divine Mother. That's the attitude that you take. Internally. Don't tell the kids. They'll think you're crazy. <laughs> they say, stop going to the Vedanta Society. What rubbish. This is an entirely internal adjustment. The moment we do it, we will immediately, immediately benefit will be there. A sense of Vivekananda sense, a sense, sense of peace and relief. Immediately. Not me, not mine. Even the body, the closest thing to us, it's not me, not mine. Thou, my Lord, you have provided me with this body, with this wonderful equipment to live this life for my spiritual development. Good. I am a sentient being in this body. But the body is not me. One sadhu put it so nicely. He says, why do you think the body is yourself? Do you have the papers for the body? <laughs> in Hindi, he says, the cop pulls you up, show me the papers. Not for your car, for your, for your body. <laughs> I don't did you make the body? No. Even your parents didn't. Nature did almost all the work. You, you didn't make the body. It, you don't have the papers for it. Did somebody gift it to you? No. Uh, then, uh, the same monk, he's saying, what else? Do you own the materials out of which this body is made? No. The earth and the fire and the water, the, all the elements and molecules, do you own them? No. Did you make them? No. Then why do you think it's your body? Well, it responds to me. I feel here, I'm here, and it responds to me. That also is not under your control. A little stroke somewhere. And then physiotherapy. Can't lift the hand. <laughs> Even just lifting the hand is such a miracle, miracle. You just have to go to a physiotherapy unit and see a stroke patient struggling to lift one hand. You realize oh, what a complex miracle it is to do this. All of it is being done by, uh, by nature. You don't even have to say God. Bhagavad Gita says, Prakriti eva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha. Nature alone does everything here. Then, then what am I? Ya pasyati tathatmanam akattaram sapasyati. The one who realizes this, realizes I am the non-doer self. You are the watcher. You are the beneficiary of this Broadway play called life in the universe. Nothing here is done by you. Not even this body. Not one bit of it actually uh, is under your control, even if it seems to be. Not even the so-called free will, even if it seems to be. It's a display put up by the Lord for our spiritual education. Vivekananda says it's a moral gymnasium you know, where we develop our spiritual muscles. And so we, we grow spiritually. So the, the practice, he says, nothing here I want. Not the good, not the bad, not the indifferent. I do not care for that. These are his words. I do not care for it. Say it to yourself. All this I sacrifice unto you. Make a whole day a continuous sacrifice of the little self unto the Lord. Remember, practically you are doing the same thing in the world outside. He says, then his words, you can charge into the middle of cannon and find peace there. The one which causes misery, the one which causes disturbance, anxiety, fear, temptation, all of that is this tentacle, being a squid, putting this tentacle forward and trying to grasp something which is on the stage. Imagine if the inter audience started interfering with the play, telling the <laughs> actors, don't do that, you have to do like this. No, you can't do that. It's meant for you to watch, for your edification, for your aesthetic enjoyment and your spiritual growth. Careful. In the body and the mind, all action will go on. So Vivekananda puts it this way. Detachment. Renunciation along with, he says, incessant activity. Then he goes on. This is from the Gita. He says, none here can cease from work even for a moment. This is a direct translation from the Gita. From even for a moment you cannot stop acting. As long as you identify this body and mind are forever in action. And why are we in action? There also. All action, whatever you go see here is all of it is meant to take us to enlightenment, to God realization. That's the purpose from Vedantic perspective. That's the purpose of life itself. Aurobindo defined it. Life itself is yoga. 
Life itself is spirituality. You know it, then you call yourself a spiritual person. I go to the Vedanta society, I read Vedanta books, I meditate, I do service, I am a yogi. Good. The other person on the street says, I don't do any of that, I am not even interested. He's still doing yoga. He might just say that I am living my life. I am just a regular guy living my life. That's also yoga. But what's the difference? The difference is that takes a lot of hard knocks and a lot, a long, long, long time of drifting around, around in the ocean of samsara, lifetime after lifetime. And then what will happen? Then you will come to yoga. So why not do it now? If you are blessed with this, at one point we will become mature that we want spirituality. And then we want spirituality, you start walking on this path. So Vivekananda's recommendation is, so this is the one takeaway from today. If you find, I understand non-duality, but now what? I can't immediately put it into practice. I can't walk the talk right now. The rubber meets the road, that's the expression. Then the way we can, what we can do, every one of us, if you are spiritual seekers, we can continuously sacrifice this little self internally. Not I, not me, not mine. Thou my Lord, thou my Lord. Thou art the master, I am the servant. Thou art the mother and this entire universe is thy play. Um, Swami Turiyananda puts it this way. He says, uh, Vivekananda could say, I am Brahman. It suited him. It doesn't suit us. In Bengali, he said, Amader Shadena. So what do we say? We say, he says, Thou my Lord, Thou, Tuhu, Tuhu, the Divine Mother, everything here in the Divine Mother. He says, through non-dual Vedanta, realize your nature as freedom itself. And then the rest of your life, Live it as a play with the Divine Mother. Your little child, a toddler playing with the mother, this entire life, until the death of this body, is a play with the mother. Do your best that you can. You will do much better when you take this attitude. When we take the I and mine attitude, we do miserably. We hurt ourselves and we hurt others. And then we end up lonely, depressed, meaningless. This whole life is a burden, sour face. It's only because of the tentacle of grasping. It won't work. You cannot grasp anything. It's continuously slipping away from our grasp, this universe. It's not meant to be grasped. It's nothing here waits for you. Now I see, I mean, people will be hurt if I say this. People come here, Vedanta, there's wonderful saving knowledge is there. But the first concern is, immediately, within a few days, is, so how do I get the kids interested in this? <laughs> no, it's a good thing, but it's always secondary. First, you become interested. You advance sufficiently in spiritual life. Kids is one thing. Even greater project, how do I get the grandkids interested in this? Because <laughs> grandparents have lots of time in their hand. Especially Indian grandparents. And their one project seems to be, since I failed with the kids. <laughs> those useless fellows. But at least the, kid, the grandkids, something I can make out of them. <laughs> no. For, it's good. You keep on doing it. The reason, I mean, I, I, I'm not knocking those efforts because I'm here because of my grandparents. My grandfather is too. When we were little kids, he used to give us books of Vivekananda and all of that. So it's good. You, it's like your duty, parental and grandparental duty to pass on this heritage to the next generation. But first and foremost, be selfish. Enlighten selfishness. Not the I, me, mine, my grandchildren. And all. No. I must realize this truth in my life and enjoy the benefits. See, I am Brahman, I am complaining, I am cribbing because I am not enjoying the benefits. I get it, but I am not enjoying the benefits. Um, the direct path says, the moment you see, say that you understand it, you have realized this if you say that, then you lose your right to grumble. You can't complain about anything in life anymore. But we are not ready to sign up for that, it's too much. Alright, Vivekananda gives you another approach. Full engagement with the world. Indeed, you must be engaged. Let us keep on doing the best that we can in the world. But with this internal attitude of not me, not mine. I don't want one single thing from this world. Not an attitude of contempt. Not an attitude of uh, indifference. No. Vivekananda says, blessed we are that we have been called out into this field. Let the giver kneel down and offer. Let the receiver stand up and, re and, and receive. It's a worship that we are doing. And we are glad, we are very happy that for the few days, few years, the divinity has come on the stage of, of time, space and causation, manifested as this universe and helping us, giving us this wonderful privilege and opportunity in the few years of our life 
to be able to do something. Yes, do it at the level of the family. Do it at the level of the community. Do it at the level of your organization of, or of the whole world. And be free, not attached. At no point say, I, me, mine. Vivekananda adds one more thing. Do not think you can help anybody. Mm. We are here to help ourselves. Selfishness, yes, but capital S. Enlightened selfishness. You are here to help yourself. By helping others, the first beneficiary is you. You yourself. Uh, you say the world is a dog's curly tail. You know? The more you try to straighten it out, it becomes like this again. But by trying to straighten out the world, should we not try? Yes, we must try. Trying to straighten out the world, we become straight ourselves. And the world is designed in this way to help us. Nothing is wrong here really. You might say terrible things are happening in the world. Yes, plunge into it. Vivekananda says plunge into the middle of ca canon and try to help wherever you can, whatever your field is. Not everything is, you don't immediately have to become an activist and go out on the streets and uh, what are you doing, Vedanta? No, you may not or you may depending on what is the field of action that we have chosen for ourselves. Plunge into it but not I, me, mine. This is my worship of the divine. In this way, when we live our lives, we will see suddenly the grand truths we were struggling with, which we understand, what we complain, we can't do it in our lives. They become practical suddenly. And we begin to get the benefit of it. We begin to get peace. And we begin to get a deep relaxation. Vivekananda says, deep relaxation within. An unbroken serenity of mind within. Which comes from detachment, non-attachment. Uh, stepping back from causality could say more about this, but I've really, really gone beyond time. Whatever we are, we are within the limits of time, space and causation, so we have to acknowledge that. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda, may they at least give us this much of strength and awareness that through the days and months of our lives in the years to come, may we continually turn our lives into one continuous sacrifice of the little self and continually say, not I, but Thou, the Mother of the Universe. Not I, but Thou, my Lord. That, that grace, let, we, let us have it in our lives. And that peace and blessing. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu does anybody have an observation or a question? Yes, the lady there. He's getting a microphone to you. Can you tell us your name and ask the question? Yes. All right, ask. I'll repeat. Yeah, my name is Vera. Um, my question is on animals and all sentient, sentient beings. Are they subject to karma? Animals, other sentient beings, are they subject to karma? Yes. Only thing is... Um, the way we understand karma, other beings, other than human beings, they don't have the conscious ability to perform new karma. So they only get the results of past karma. And when that, those are exhausted, uh, whatever produced that particular animal birth, then they go on to other births and hopefully to a human birth where they can generate new karma. So new karma is possible only in the human birth. So the ones that ended up at slaughterhouses, are they living out through their old karma? The old karma will lead to the destruction of that body and then uh, back again to maybe a, hopefully a human birth, somewhere we can generate better karma. One point I would like to make. Karma, as you notice in this whole talk, spirituality is going beyond karma, beyond maya. Transcending the mind. Karma, mind, maya are all at the same level. That's what Vivekananda is trying to show us. Transcending causality is spirituality. Why I'm saying this is people are fascinated by karma. And I want to impress upon you. Karma is not spirituality. Karma is this world. Transcending this world, freedom from this world, freedom from karma is spirituality. Every spiritual path takes you beyond causality. What is devotion? We catch hold of a being, God or an incarnation, who is beyond causality, we catch hold of that. What is karma yoga? Good and bad, these are part of causality. Karma yoga is, I will do good, I don't want the result. Then that means you are going beyond causality. 
So every spiritual path takes you beyond causality. And the highest non-dual path, Jnana Yoga, it tells you, you yourself are beyond causality. And see that and you are free. So every spiritual path is going beyond karma. Does that mean karma is useless? No. Karma is a civilizing in influence. From our instinctive life to a careful moral life, karma helps us. Be careful about what we do in this world. But to go beyond that is the spiritual. God is beyond karma. Your own soul, your real nature is beyond karma. Reality is beyond causality. Reality becomes an appearance coming through causality. So many hands. All right, the gentleman there. Thank you, Swamiji. My name is Ankit. Yes. Uh, in the law of karma, is there a concept of interest over time? So like if you do something good, it compounds in life, or if you do something bad, it also compounds because like growing up, I was taught if you do something bad, fix it immediately versus like waiting longer. So just curious if I really don't up. know and I'm really not interested. <laughs> yes, do something wrong, fix it immediately. That's very good. That's very good. As fast as we can, as fast as we can. In the New Testament, Jesus says that if you are going to offer something to the Lord, you come with, to an offering, and then you suddenly remember, I have some, a dispute with my brother. Leave the offering right there. Go back and fix it. Uh, settle it with your brother, and then come back and offer it. Otherwise, the Lord will not accept it. Which, which is a way of saying, spirituality is not possible with lots of bad karma. We have to fix our life, clean up our life to the extent possible, and then, of course, spiritual effort should go on all the time. The more good karma we have on our side, the easier spiritual life becomes. In fact, easier all sorts of life becomes. So one good idea is to continuously do good karma, wherever you get the opportunity to do, go do good, and to carefully avoid bad karma. I have so many stories of karma, but coming from India, it's obvious. <laughs> we have these stories of people explain. Karma is a civilizing influence. One sadhu, he put it um, this way. He said, the more modern people have become the have lost faith in the law of karma. What difference it makes is this. He says, um, when we were um, children in a village, you know, this was pre-independence India, more than 100 years ago. People used to say that, I can't take a bribe because I have children and grandchildren. The idea being, if I do something wrong, it will impact my family and it will be bad for me. It will go badly for me and my family. I can't take a bribe. I'm sorry. I can't do what you say. I can't take a bribe. I can't tell a lie because I have children and grandchildren. And he says, nowadays people say, I ha I'm sorry, I have to take the bribe because I have children and grandchildren. <laughs> What's the difference? The other person has this belief. Call it a religious belief. That actions have consequences. You sow what you reap. Or you reap what you sow. Actions have consequences. And therefore I'm careful about my actions. The other one doesn't believe that. The other one believes it's great as long as you're not caught. As long as the cops and the IRS don't catch me, I can do all sorts of things. That is a, that is a materialist. It's a materialist. Does not believe in any unseen, spiritual, religious. Yeah. So that karma is a very powerful civilizing um, uh, effect. Oh, one more point I'll just make here. I didn't get a chance there, but I'll make it here. Vivekananda brings up the question of duty. Why are people doing things in the world, not for spiritual purposes? They might even say, no, no, we are not doing it for self-satisfaction or we have this thirst for this life. No, we don't. But it's duty. I have to do this because it's my duty. I have to take care of my family. I have to do my job in the, in the um, workplace because they're paying me. It's my duty. And Vivekananda is scathing on the idea of duty. He says, duty is the midday scorching sun, which scorches the innermost soul of humanity. They have been put to task. They have been, the harness has been put to them. Morning and evening they are at it till they, he says, they die in harness, till exhausted and, you know, they collapse and they are finished. Duty is upon them. Vivekananda says, duty is upon them. And then he goes on to say, if you are spiritual, first of all, you have no duty. And you have no, say that you have no duty. Oh, then? All duties are there. He says, it is his duty. All duties are his or hers, the Divine Mother. And do the same thing that you are doing, but do it in freedom. Anything that you do under compulsion, I don't want to do it, but it's my duty. It just puts more bondage upon you. He says, act like a free person, not like a slave. Not compelled. 
but because it's good for me, it's spiritual. I'll give you an example. Um, so as monks, one little personal example. Once at one time I was a novice in our main monastery and my duty was to, duty, was to uh, serve food, rice. Um, so there were these huge cauldrons of rice and you had, you had these big, big uh, um, ladles with which you lift the rice and put it into buckets and then you take the buckets and race back to the, where the people are sitting for food. They would sit on the floor and you'd have to serve. And it was hot. It was the Calcutta summer, 100 degrees uh, hum in 100% humidity. 100 degrees in 100% humidity, in the shade. So I was feeling this is not good. As I'm, I was saying that this is not very spiritual. <laughs> and I don't like it. And the answer came to me from within immediately. Go, who's stopping you? You're a monk. It's an entirely, every moment of it is you're doing it in freedom. The gates are open. Literally, my mind said, the gates are open, walk out. If you think this is not good for you, if you think it's not good for you, it's not helping you spiritually, walk out. Then immediately, of course, the mind you know, came back to my senses. No, it is good for me. I am doing it um, uh, out of my freedom. See, we delude ourselves and I have to do it. No, you don't have to do anything in this world. However, it's good to do it. It's great for our spiritual development. Do it in freedom not in the sense of duty. Does, is duty useless then? No. Vivekananda says duty has a certain use. It turns the animal into the human. It turns an immature child into a responsible adult. That's what duty does. It turns the tamasika person into a rajasika person. But when you become sattvika, spiritual seeker, you continue to do the same thing but as a free person. Last question. Yes, the lady there. Hi, Swamiji, I'm Kavita. Yes. I'm still processing everything, but uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, I came across the concept or the term Nimitta Matram. Nimitta Matram? Nimitta Matram. So I'm just wondering if it's related to this idea of detachment Absolutely. and um, duty, and if you can kind of help me make that connection. Absolutely. Be thou just uh, an instrument. The Lord will work out his purposes. We don't believe that. We think we are doing it. Well. Robert Sapolsky, determined, is telling you, you are not, you are deluded if you think you are doing anything. It's all being done, maybe through you, but see this as a great game which you are playing with the Divine Mother. Or see it as a worship, whatever suits your mentality. Let us see it as a worship of the God I adore, this whole universe. And then I will try to do my best. What about bad things in this world? I will try to correct it to the best of my ability. Will it work? Maybe not. But this is what I am here to do. And I am the first beneficiary. Beneficiary. Vivekananda says, we are blessed that we have been called out to this field of action. Kurukshetra, the battlefield. We have been called out to serve here. Uh, one monk it put it so beautifully. This is, I'll leave you with this idea. He says, he was old and sick, um, sort of dying in, in the monastery. He was full of happiness. And he said this so beautifully. He said, um, it is a great blessing and happiness to have been chosen and to have been used and broken and set aside. There's a great peace in it. We have been chosen, all of us. If you have see, no particular purpose, point in life, no, there also, in that particular place, you still have control over your thoughts. Think five holy thoughts a day. So we have our own field of action. Let us give up those sour faces. Uh -huh. Vivekananda says, you have no right, a, a, a sour face is a sickness, you have no right to take it out into the world. Uh, nowadays, of course, we wear ma masks, but uh, we, we, uh, this is our field of action, let's be happy. We will be taken care of. There is a huge, there is a tremendous power behind all of this, and it is helping us in our spiritual progress. We will not die at the end of this body. We were not created by the beginning of this, this particular body. And we are ancient beings and we will go continue on our spiritual progress. And if we do this, what Vivekananda says, a continuous sacrifice internally. My Lord, I am worshipping you in these ways. Through these words, through these actions, with these people. We will find in this life itself, we will get, uh, it's a guaranteed thing. You will get by the grace of the Lord, we will get this non-dual realization and final freedom in this life itself. It will work. Thank you so much. Thank you.